The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. This fragment of verse by the Greek poet Archilochus was famously explored by Isaiah Berlin in his celebrated essay, The Hedgehog and the Fox, an essay about Tolstoy's view of history. Berlin di divided thinkers into two categories, the hedgehogs and the foxes, and attempted to argue that Tolstoy was a hedgehog with fox-like tendencies. Berlin later said, I never meant it very seriously. I meant it as a kind of enjoyable intellectual game, but it was taken seriously. And so, without taking too seriously either the Archilochus fragment or the Berlin essay, I would like to suggest to you that Don and I are hedgehogs. I have a hunch that Rafi has hedgehog-like tendencies as well, but I don't know his work broadly enough to make that claim. When I say that Don and I are literary hedgehogs, this is because each of us spent 10 years researching and writing our recent books. While the foxes of the writing world were happily producing books at regular, frequent intervals, we were digging into our respective very deep holes, burrowing so deeply, in fact, that at times we even doubted that we'd be able to find our way to the surface again. In Dawn's case, these efforts have resulted in the book that we are here to celebrate tonight. The Hundred Year Walk is a meticulously researched, beautifully written, and thoughtful work in which Dawn has woven together memoir, travel chronicle, family lore, and political history. It is a deeply personal story, but as the subtitle indicates, an Armenian odyssey, it is also part of a community and a communal project. 100 years ago, Armenians in the Ottoman Empire were the victims of a horrific crime. The mass annihilation of hundreds of thousands of people and the near complete erasure of Armenians from the lands where they had lived for many centuries, if not from the beginning of recorded history. In the face of these devastating losses, most of those who survived were dispersed around the world where they fashioned new families and communities. These communities were bound together by religious institutions, by language, and by shared history. They were also knit together, I would argue, by the stories that they told. Stories about the towns and villages that were lost, about the people who died and those who survived, about their lives in these new lands. These stories were passed from parent to child and more frequently from grandparent to grandchild. But these narratives are also produced by the modern day equivalent of the Armenian Ashur, or troubadours. In memoirs, novels, histories, and poems, post-genocide Armenian writers, many in the diaspora and often using the languages of their adopted countries, geographies that are not simply stories of return, have created new geographies in co of connection and belonging. Geographies that are not simply stories of return, but stories with motion of their own that take us to places both grounded in history and unmoored in imagination. What Dawn has given us in the Hundred Year Walk is a multi-generational story of resilience and survival. She and Rafi are going to talk to us now about the process of writing the book as well as about the ways the past, the present, and the future inform and create each other. And after we hear more about Dawn's and her grandfather's journeys, I exhort you to buy at least two copies of her book, one for home and one for the road. Thank you so much, Nancy and Laura, and thank you so much for everyone for coming tonight and supporting um, this book. There's too many of you to thank individually, but just please know that I'm eternally grateful for all your support over the last decade in, in helping me finish the 100-year walk. During the Great Depression, my grandparents, my two-year-old mother and my five-year-old aunt arrived in New York from Turkey. Desperate to flee Istanbul, they had entered the United States with doctored documents after paying off a crooked priest. My grandparents had miraculously survived the Armenian genocide, but had lost almost everything else in the war and the aftermath. They were so thankful to be in this country that 
they were so thankful to be in this country and finally feel free of persecution. From their cramped apartment on West 133rd and Amsterdam Avenue, neighbors could often hear my grandfather play God Bless America on the accordion. <laughs> the sound reverberating down the narrow hallways of the tenement building. As a refugee without any money, my grandfather had to be extremely resourceful, and that included, that included stringing up a hammock for my mother's bed. One time, he wanted to move to the adjacent building because the rent was $5 cheaper. Instead of carting the furniture all the way down the stairs and up again, he simply placed a plank of wood between the two building's windows and very carefully slid everything across. It had to be the cheapest New York move ever. In the candy store he soon opened, he toiled around the clock. And it was there he told my mother a story she would soon learn by heart. He took her back to World War I and the last days of the Ottoman Empire when the government deported the estimated two million Armenians from their homes, driving more than half of them to their deaths, including countless Greeks and Syrians as well. My grandfather spent the rest of his life documenting his experience in his journals, and in doing so, his, his children say he was almost purging it from the depths of his soul. Being a witness to that satanic pogrom I vowed it as my duty to put to paper what I saw, recounted my grandfather in his journals. I grew up with this story like many Armenian families. Since my grandfather died when I was three, I didn't know much else about him besides these sad stories of him walking across a desert and having to drink his own urine because he was that thirsty. I could never read his account because it was published in Armenian. Which, and was pu um, which was published in the 60s in Armenian. It was only after it was translated into English that I could finally understand what he had endured. As I was reading it and turning the pages, I couldn't believe that this endangered protagonist was my own grandfather. I couldn't believe how close my whole family had come to not existing at all. Not many survived the massacres in what's now eastern Syria. Fewer still left documentation. While he's long gone, his account is important testimony to a crime that Turkey still denies occurred. Undertaking this book was not a choice for me. I had to finish the book that my grandfather began. Quitting my magazine job in New York, I moved back home to Los Angeles. And when I say home, I mean home, back into my parents' house. <laughs> When the last time I lived there, I had 80s hair about this big. <laughs> when I realized how, how pathetic my social life had suddenly become and the enormity of the task, I was going to quit. But then just then, my mother unearthed two more of my grandfather's notebooks. And then my uncle checked his garage and found two more at the bottom of a box in the garage. I knew I couldn't turn back then. These journals filled in my grandfather's life before the these journals filled in my grandfather's life before the war. Decades after my grandfather's death, I got to know a man who wasn't defined by just being a survivor of the genocide. He was a friend, he was a colleague, he was a brother, and he was an entrepreneur, and he loved a good prank. With my mother encouraging me, I set out to tell my grandfather's story. I went back to the, his hometown of Adabazar, which is now called Adabazari, about 100 miles east of modern-day Istanbul. I became consumed with the newspapers of that town and became lost in their world. It was almost a spiritual experience to be so close to the past and to read their dreams before the war and then to see their resilience in the aftermath. When World War I broke out, my grandfather was a courier and a messenger, and he was soon conscripted into doing road construction in a labor battalion. The next year, in 1915, the Ottoman government deported Armenians from their homes and put them into cattle cars that chugged toward internment camps in the middle of nowhere. My grandfather was separated from his family and pushed to the worst part, which is now eastern Syria. He withstood living outside in a makeshift camp like this one, 
surviving the elements and diseases that in January of 1916 killed 1,000 people in his camp in just 60 hours. After being pushed along the Euphrates in a caravan of thousands, he miraculously escaped just before his companions were killed. He walked across the desert for a week with just two cups of water as other, others around him died or were killed. Yet he never gave up on life and seeing his siblings again. After making a daring escape from his caravan, he was desperate for refuge. It was then he heard about this sympathetic sheikh nearby and approached him. My grandfather disguised himself and wrapped a headscarf around his hair, trying to blend in, but the sheikh was not fooled. He knew who my grandfather was and took him in any way, despite the rhetoric that he had heard about the Armenians being dangerous people. He took my grandfather in and my grandfather became like a son to him. Reading my grandfather's exhaustive account, I knew I had to follow his steps. And in 2000, I set off to follow his 1,000 mile odyssey from his hometown outside, outside Istanbul all the way to eastern Syria near the Iraq border. I had to see this desert so I could better um, understand what my grandfather went through. While in Syria though, I found the family of the man, the Arab Sheikh who saved my grandfather's life. When I met them, 300 people greeted me in the village and it was, it was a Cinderella moment really. The women whisked me away and put on a hijab and this beautiful dress and then they slaughtered a goat and we all sat around and ate together. <laughs> Being an almost vegetarian, it was a, it was a different experience for me. What affects me the most is the ripple effect of one kind act. Four generations of my family are now alive because of it. And when they first heard about me, they thought that I was in danger and in need, and they said it was their custom to take in people in need. Just recently, the desert where the Armenians marched and died has become known to a new generation. With the ongoing Syrian war, the so-called Islamic State has taken over the towns where my grandfather barely survived, names like Bab, Raqqa, and Derzor, names long known to Armenians but becoming known as a site for new humanitarian crimes. In the desert, we are seeing similar images to what my grandfather witnessed a century ago of people fleeing from their homes, or being led out to death, women abused, all against a stark and unforgiving desert. It's history repeating itself. With the, minor, with the persecution of minorities and also as well of other Muslims who are declared not to be faithful enough. In these tumultuous times, I often return to the story of my grandfather, a Christian Armenian, and the Sheikh, a Muslim Arab. Their relationship is a testament to crossing the boundaries of ethnicity and religion and connecting. My grandfather had a compassionate heart. He knew that he didn't survive this alone. Along the Euphrates, where so many had died, he was saved by Christian Armenians, Muslim Turks, and Muslim Arabs, and never forgot those individuals. The story of my family in the Syrian one is still unfolding and has come full circle. The family that gave my family refuge are, are now in need of shelter themselves. After I closed the book, one of the family members fled and made it the way, his way to Europe. It, there in Europe, he's now trying to begin a new life just like my grandfather did in New York all those years ago. Thank you. So now Rafi and I will be discussing, be in conversation. That was a few years younger, so he was probably in his mid twenties. While you take your seat, I'll just add <coughs> that um, some some things have already been said about a project that takes ten years, and um, one of the hallmarks of of that is that 
there evolves, sorry, there evolves through that, that long process of maturation and distillation of a project, a level of, of depth, of nuance, uh, a sense of, of grays, of the social complexity of, of humanity in a world where there are all these very stark divisions in, in, our, in our general understanding of Turk, Armenian, Christian, Muslim, and these things have been alluded to. And, and uh, that can't be replicated with something that is done quickly. It's very hard to, to do that. And, uh, and, and the result of that process is something that I think is uh, both wonderful and going to endure. So just my little two cents here before, before we get started. Um, you wrote that at the outset, and maybe we can kind of unpack a little bit of some of the things that have already been said, that um, as you began, your grandfather was a kind of one-dimensional figure, just this almost maybe caricature of survivor. At what point, as you began your research, uh, did that caricature dissolve? Well, it, it started to dissolve when we found the, the notebooks at my mother's house, and it, it detailed just all these hijinks with his friends, and he was always trying to pull off a caper, whether or not it was you know, speaking a fake language with his friends to try to get attention in a crowd or trying to get his friend to pay the bill of a very large, you know, bill at a restaurant just as a joke to see his face. And so I started to see my grandfather. It's just this very, my mother's pretty funny. So I was just, I started to see my grandfather as this very funny person. Of course, incredibly smart as well. And I also, I learned more about him as I did research because uh, while I believed his story, I didn't know how accurate he was at every turn. And so once I started to research it and matching up dates with documents and other people's accounts, I saw how, how absolutely accurate he was in his account. And so it, it just gave me a larger picture of him. Yeah, take us back to um, the beginning of your project when you're back at home and the enormity of the research is ahead of you. Um, you know, how did you how did you begin in terms of even getting through journals that were written in a language that you didn't understand? And this was a almost a communal effort, as you describe it in the book. Absolutely was. There's so many of you in this room who helped me along the way. I can't speak or read Armenian. I'm half Armenian, and so to even read a book which was in Armenian and be able to hand off the correct book to to someone else, I, it's in script. So I started taking Armenian classes at nighttime to be able to even do that. And then also to, to go through the journals and even know what was in them, we started going to all of my mother's friends, all these little, little old ladies who lived in our neighborhood and I hadn't been there since I was a kid and they were trying to give me wafers <laughs> and with doily tables and, and they were just amazing. And I would sit there with them for hours and I was just brought back, of course, to my childhood, but back to the community as well. And it was just incredible that part was really special to me as well as uncovering what my grandfather was saying. But there's more. There, is there a way to... Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, but there, there's more tenacity in there than, than that because you placed advertisements in national and local Armenian newspapers to track people down to help corroborate a story. You went to a library in Paris, a Viennese monastery. Um, at one point you even uh, found the tale of someone who had traveled with your grandfather recounted in a Romanian newspaper. And if you read as I do and you see I I in the texture of your story, there are these very quick allusions to sources that seem extremely obscure. And maybe you could talk a little before we get to the substance of just what it means, you know, to, to unearth that stuff. Okay, I was completely obsessed with my grandfather's story, and so <laughs> I had to just, I had to expand his story at every point, and, and as a reporter, it was, his account was kind of a dream, because when he would list people who were in his caravan, he would say their first name, their last name, where they were from, what town, and so that really helped me. He gave me dates of when he was in certain camps and when he was in certain areas, so I used all of that as a starting point. Of course, I also, there was, there was this book that um, a lot of the Armenians wrote, a lot of the Armenians who, after the genocide, they, they compiled these books 
on their towns and about what their lives were like before they, lo they were lost. And so that book, the one on my grandfather's town became the Bible for me, who were the important people in the town. Then I had to try to find the newspapers that were published in this town before the war. And so I found those in Armenia and in Austria. And of course, they're in Armenian, so then it's going through them. So I traveled to a monastery in Vienna to look at those newspapers. I hired people in Armenia to go through um, some of the, also the memoirs and other accounts of people from Adabazar because they all talked about each other. They would all talk about who they saw during the deportation, who was with them. And so that just, a picture started emerging from cross-referencing all those sources. Take us back to Adabazar before the war. Uh, you describe it, and this is the beginning of your grandfather's odyssey in many ways, uh, as a hopeful time. Um, uh, it, it seems as though a wave of liberal, liberalism is, is kind of sweeping through the empire. And, uh, and, and your grandfather, who I, be I believe begins as a kind of peddler in, in, the, in the town, starts dreaming big and decides to become a courier and going back and forth from Istanbul and, and, and bring us back into that point of his life uh, before the troubles uh, occur. Well, it was extremely helpful as you describe and I just fell in love with this period and, and just kept not wanting to turn the page to when the war began because they were extremely happy and hopeful and their dreams were coming true. My grandfather was part of a committee to build an assembly hall in their town and that was a big deal. They would volunteer on the weekends, you know, to plant, you know, flowers around it to turn a silk, uh, like a mill into this assembly hall. They were holding, you know, theater and plays and, and they opened up a reading room and it was just an incredible time. And my grandfather also, with this political change that seemed to promise, promise equality, my grandfather changed his lot in life. He took a big risk and he became this new profession of a courier and he was traveling back and forth between his town and um, then called you know, Constantinople, not present day Istanbul. And so he was excited and it broke my heart because he was so proud of, of his business that he had established and one very important man in Constantinople told him he would be a very great man because of what he had been do doing so far. And so, of course, with the outbreak of the war and then the genocide, it, it changed everything for him and my family. It's one of the heartbreaking parts of the story is to see that same ingenuity, that same uh, intelligence uh, being applied to absolute survival at the most fundamental level rather than prosperity and advancement in what would otherwise perhaps would have been an alternate course in history. At what point did the people of Adabazar, your grandfather included, come to realize that things were changing, perhaps not for the best? You know, it was uh, in 1915, um, one person in his town said that he had heard and he just started plotting, you know, the next moment, I'm gonna try to escape, and so, he just kept constantly looking for avenues on how, how can I get out of this, how can I escape, where's my next moment to slip out and, and try to survive. Was there a moment for you in researching his story when you still saw him making these decisions uh, and you, you saw just some, some moment of insight that was particularly special for you? I, I mean, all of... All of his decisions inspire me because I would have definitely died. I am not. <laughs> I am not that resourceful. I. I def, it's true. I would not have made the same decisions as him. And he was just. He was. He was not only physically strong. I mean, in one camp, he survived by selling water. And while you know people weren't eating or drinking, and people weren't eating, they were starving. And how do you have the strength to to walk? You know. Um, you know, three quarters of a mile back and forth carrying water to sell to the other people who are dying. So it's it's that kind of physical stamina, but also the mental stamina that he had that really propelled him to survive. And he just, it, this book to me, it's about family. It's my grandfather trying to get home and see his family again. And 
my part of it is about my mother and I and my own family history and discover more about it. At every point of the way, it comes up again, he immediately starts looking for work. Right, and sometimes exactly. it's very kind of, you could see his personality shining through in that, that, that impulse. It's like the first thing, I need to find work. Right, absolutely. He, he transformed, he was a chameleon. He transformed water carrier to, at one point, he made candles in the camp because they were outside in the elements and um, he thought, okay, people need to see. So he made, he, he made candles. He, he did so many, oh, at another time when there was a flood of their camp and everyone, so many people had died and they were just under, buried alive basically in the mud and people were trying to get out and he went around and he started carrying people out of the mud and you know people would, those who did have some money would give him a little money. So he just constantly transformed himself in order to survive. And so I, I was just in awe of him throughout his whole experience and not just in one part. At what point he makes the decision to leave the labor battalion? Can you tell us when that happened and, and what transpires? Yes, yeah, so that happened when he was going up the hills in what's now eastern Turkey, and that was when he was being hit, and he just knew he had to had to escape. So he waited for the right moment and made an attempt to escape. It didn't work, and so finally, when he was near Katma, which is now in in Syria he was walking and and what would happen is a lot of times when people would go through the camps all the people from the camps would kind of look to see who was in the caravan to see if they you know the families are separated so they want to see if they see a lost brother or a sibling or a mother and so he's these this crowd had come to his his to see his labor battalion and so my grandfather he just kind of slipped into, he saw someone from his town, handed his bag, and slipped into the crowd. And at that point, he said, ended his life as a, you know, a soldier in the Turkish army. At that point, he became a deportee, and he was in the camps, and, and he just kept being pushed farther and farther east toward, you know, into what's now Syria, toward the Iraq border. What was life like in those camps uh, that were at the border of what is now Syria and Turkey? The, the first camps that he, that he stepped into. Disease was rife. So many people died from disease. And also when they would clear a camp, it was extremely violent. And if, if you couldn't get out of your, your, your tent or whatever, your, your, your nap that was over you, they would either you know, many gendarmes would either beat the people or set them on fire. Um, so they set them on fire. So it was extremely brutal. And then they would force them onto these desert marches, and those who couldn't keep up were killed on many, many occasions. He, it's amazing you mentioned uh, this constant search for people from your area. And amidst all this upheaval and turmoil, he's always finding people from your right. area. <laughs> Uh, right. you know, people from his town or the town next door, uh, and, and these are people who know his neighbors or know of him directly. Absolutely, and if you read the testimonies from this time period, the, the camps were often really grouped by hometown, and my grandfather would recognize um, the, the tents from his town by, by the rag carpet that was on the outside of, of the tents. And they really helped each other. And as one person said in one of their um, memoirs, is that you know it was our new Ada Bazaar, you know, out, we they they recreated it in these towns and helped each other. Whether or not you know our mother was going into labor, or if someone needed help, or um, you know if there was a priest around and they needed to bury someone. So um, they I, that I mean there was a very strong sense of community in um, in their town and with the Armenians time, even in the camps. You, you mentioned some of the names that he records in his book, and just stepping out of his story for a moment, in your process of reporting and researching and reaching out to all the, as many descendants as you could find of these people, was there a, a moment where you were giving information to other family members, that things that were in his journal, where you were perhaps changing someone's perception of their own grandparent, uh, based on what you learned? Absolutely, Rafi. There was this one family, and they had a flour mill in um, Tarsus, which is eastern Turkey. And they had taken in a lot of Armenian, you know, they were able to stay in their town because they, they had this important flour mill. 
and the Ottoman military needed flour, you know, for bread during the war. And I had read about the, the, this family in other testimonies, and my grandfather ended up at one point in this, in, working in this flour mill toward the end of the war. And I, I really wanted to find this family. And so I finally found them, the son of this family in um, Canada. And so I called him up <laughs> and explained who I was. And he really didn't know much about his father's role in saving many Armenians' lives. And you know, I then talked to his niece. And I spoke to a cousin in Beirut after that. And they sent me a picture of the flour mill which helped me, it was only maybe came down to one sentence in the book, but I was able to describe it. So it's very you know, rewarding for me. That's the process of slow cooking. <laughs> the the distillation where the photo that comes about from a conversation from the niece ends up becoming one line in the book. And that's, that's what you can't recreate. Um, there's a moment in that scene that I love that shows your grandfather's resourcefulness. And the video talked about ordinary new Americans, but your grandfather is anything but ordinary in some way. At one point, he looks over the shoulder of the accountant, I think, and says, oh, no, your, your calculations are off. Uh, and then that gets him a good job at the, at the mill. Absolutely. And this was toward the end of the war, and he was, he was um, working at this mill, and he was very good in math, I think, because he was, you know, he was, he was a peddler for many years before, always selling clothes and calculating. He was also very detailed in his journals about how much money he had with him at all times if it went down by one pata or what he would note it. And so he was very good at math. And when he corrected this man who was higher than him, they, they kind of promoted him out of the kind of grunt labor and, and gave him a better job. So he's at those camps that are at the border of what is now uh, uh, Turkey and Syria. And um, the progression toward Gerizor, which is um, the kind of culmination point of the, of the death marches, let's say, uh, or where uh, a more systemized form of killing is going to occur, uh, kind of begin. Um, how does he move forward then at that point? At what point is, how, does, how is he propelled out of that particular camp where he's stayed and learned some, like collecting water from people and, and, and doing a life? So, um... The, the camps, they would move the people from, from the west to the east and, and just kept taking them farther and farther east. And it, 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 was, it really, the scenery and the situation just got darker and darker the farther east that he went. And it culminated in this region called Derzor, which you may be hearing about in the news now, the Islamic State controls that whole area from Raqqa, which is their, which is their so-called capital. Um, so my grandfather goes along this line that we're, we're hearing about so much these days and so many, where so many Armenians died in that very same region. So he goes along the Euphrates and he gets to the Derzor region and then the camp is just slowly emptied out. And where are these people going? You know, they're kind of sent northern along the Carver River. And he, this, this, my grandfather, you know, it, it's just, it's interesting to read their accounts because they'll kind of, learn what's happening to them, to them, and then they'll take a step and be like, no, this can't be happening. And so then they would believe, because a lot of the guards would tell them, you're going home soon, you're going home. And he, my grandfather, even though he would write, oh, we're, we're being killed, and then he would hear that, and oh, maybe we are going home, and because you want to believe that this isn't happening. So my grandfather's in this Derzor area, and then slowly, you know, they just kept being pushed north, and that was where almost his whole caravan was killed and he made an escape around you know in the middle of the night and and the thing about this region is especially at that time there there weren't a lot of eyewitnesses this was before mass media and the desert was very forgiving there weren't a lot of settlements and so my grandfather had to cross six days cross the desert for six days with two cups of water and no food and he just set up by himself and just found his way eventually, you know, just endured extreme physical pain, emotional, and just tested his limits in, in every way and finally made it to the Euphrates. It's an interesting thing that comes up in the book, which is 
you know, as as he is moving and as his community is being pushed further and further into this forlorn desert spot, there is there constantly is a struggle with with optimism and pessimism, and, and, and can we believe are we going to make it out of here or not? And and it's interesting, even at that moment when he first arrives at Der Zor, and he writes, it's an open air prison. It's very obvious that there there that this is that this is what this is, and yet he's he's still fighting not to lose hope as, as, as thousands of people are, are, are converging on this spot. And um, I'm just gonna, you're, you're too shy to do this, but I, I'm not. I wanna show you what this, what, 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 what take you there the way she has. I'm gonna read two paragraphs, if it's all right. Please. <laughs> it's a human flood, Stepan thought, her grandfather as the thousands inched forward along the Euphrates. Clouds of dust settled on them one after another, coats of earthen paint on their olive skin, on their matted beards or braids. Stefan's convoy was being driven into a more solitary part of the desert, all of them stopped by the weight of their belongings, bent like half moons above the dirt. He believed their Zor was the end of the world. Now, though, he could see it wasn't, and as he pushed further east, it was like he was falling off the map into uncharted territory. There were no large towns within view, only a landscape with little or no water beyond the footpath. So far, he hadn't seen any oncoming caravans, and the Armenians coursed only in one direction, southeast, like the, like the river they followed. It's amazing. Thank you, Ralph. <laughs> Thank you for reading that. <laughs> well, um, an interesting thing happens once he gets there, and part of the kind of psychological ebb and flow. Rations arrive, money is dispersed. The exact opposite you would think uh, when you enter an open air prison. Why was that? Why, what would happen there? And what effect was that on the, on the people? Right. It was it was very confusing confusing for my grandfather and the people around him because as he knew that they were all being exterminated, there was a point where they received some rations and he had heard it come from the United States. And so they started to believe again that they were gonna be okay. And I, I can't tell you why it was distributed. Were they trying to help move the people farther north, um, where they're ultimately exterminating them? You know, there was this um, hill area where they were taking the caravans and where they took my grandfather's caravan, and they would, it was a very flat desert except for this hill area in this region, and that's where they were doing the slaughtering. So yeah, it was a very, very, uh, he, he couldn't make sense of it, but if there was one, if you could latch on to one thing and give you hope, then you latch on to it and, and believe, because who wants to believe that they're about to be slaughtered? There are moments of surreality in this story that struck me too. There's this kind of post-apocalyptic landscape of this place. For, I, I'm gonna say two, two that struck out at me, and I don't know if there Please. were any you know, thoughts on them or if there were, you had the same. One is your grandfather has a, in his perpetual search for work, finds a, 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 a a wagon and he's got a wheel that he's got to repair and he goes out and in, in, in leaves the camp and is heading towards the city and he sits down and and um, a, a voice comes from the bush behind him <laughs> and says in Armenian basically who, who are you and your grandfather just starts explaining and then just while he's explaining the guy starts walking away slithering through the bushes and there's this moment where he doesn't really know what to say next, and then there's another guy right there. Right, right. <laughs> he asks the same question. Right, right. Yes, um, my grandfather, it was a very hot day, as, as Syria can be during, during the summer, and my grandfather had, um, there was just this little place to rest with some shade as we sat there in front of this bush, and all of a sudden, you know, he has a back to the bushes, and someone starts talking to him, and he, um, when he said his name, someone else came in and they said, oh, I know who you are, step on the Mata Bazaar, we've seen you on the streets, you know, with your, you know, peddling your wares. And so 
this, uh, they, so it's through that, con that conversation was a really important one for my grandfather because the people in the bushes had escaped from the camp and they had told my grandfather about the killings and how they're all being, you know, don't believe what you're hearing, you're going to be killed. And so he had this whole conversation with his back to them and never saw them. And, but it gave him more information and helped, helped him make decisions on what to do next. Bit by bit, escapees are telling them what's happening behind the hill or a little bit off from the, uh, and he's piecing it together and struggling with what to do, it seems, as, as were, were the others. Absolutely. Yeah, they're all kind of coming to this reckoning. But even, even after it was so clear, there were some people, and I believe this is kind of the, the moments you're talking about, where there was a, another woman who she, she trusted, you know, this, this man said, well, give me your belongings. She was a very wealthy woman. Give me your belongings, and I'll, I'll take them. You know, it's too heavy for you to carry. I'll take them. I'll hold on to them. And um, the, she could, um, and she had said no, and this, um, the caravan was cut, and her porter, her porter went ahead, and then the next day, the, um, someone else was wearing her husband's fine suits, and you know, she was one of the guards, and so, if you see those things, but still, many of them kept believing until the last moment that they were gonna be okay. There comes a point where you're that, you're that whole caravan that your grandfather came in on, is moving forward, and for me, this is one of the most touching moments of the of the story. It's the first time that he says, "I, I no longer had hope," and yet at the same time, he has this other moment of real a moment of clarity, where he's trying to find a silver lining on his situation. And I was wondering if you could talk about that because I think it's just such a key turning point in his story. Where. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, it was right before they were killed. When he's thinking about his family, and he's thinking, well, at least it's only me. Right, yes, absolutely. So he, he knew they were going to be killed, and he um, knew it was his last night because all the people in front of him had been killed. And so he, he had this moment where he just felt so thankful that his family was not there because he saw his whole family is being killed and his his father it was it was almost the anniversary of his of his father's death i believe or birthday i can't remember and so he he says a prayer to his father i'm going to be with you and he was so happy that he was alone and he'd be the only one killed in his family and so what prompts him to escape after that well, he gives and out. How did he do it? Well, he starts to hear whispers of other people talking about escape, and he was had had he basically had given up and resigned himself with death. Which, through many points in his account, he he said it would have been easier to die than to continue. And but then he hears whispers of other people talking, and it just kind of enlivened him again and gave him hope. And he decided to escape. And then he started to go around the caravan and very quietly come with me to his friends and those who had survived with him up until then. And many wouldn't go. And he, so he ventured out on his own and went on this. And because the desert, there wasn't, there wasn't, the Euphrates was very far from there. And we just, Many knew that they would just die, even with the desert crossing from where they were to make to the Euphrates. It took my grandfather six days. So, and even after he escaped, and he was walking across, he met up with other Armenians who had escaped from different caravans, and then they started all walking together. And uh, and then you know some of them died on the way. Actually, most of them died. I think out of 60, maybe 14, he ended up in a big large group of 60, and only 14 made it to the Euphrates. And how many of them actually made it after that? Because that wasn't the end of the war. I don't know. That's right, because when they arrive at the Euphrates, the first thing they meet are bandits. Exactly, and then they're robbed right before they're about to take their drink of water. So it's just misfortune, fun misfortune. But it's he's. 
his strength and was so inspiring to me. He just, outside of moments where he was about to give up, he just really wanted to see his family again and just would, you know, at moments where he didn't know what to do, he would look at the landscape around him and he even consulted the Euphrates. The Euphrates, right, which is almost this godlike figure in the, in the area, you know, giving water. And he looks into the waves and he sees how he basically asks the Euphrates what to do. And he looks into the water and he said, well, the, the waves and the water keeps moving, so I should too. So he found his strength from so many different places, from, from the river, from other people, and, and from a, a deep inner strength inside. You mentioned that he was uh, taken in by this sheikh, um, and he spends, I guess, the sort of duration of the war in this bubble, and then there's a kind of brief moment of normalcy there that is just, again, another one of those moments of sur surreality where he, he becomes an important advisor and has flirtations with local women and, you know, can swim and have a little bit of fun even though the war is happening not far away. Absolutely, it's my favorite part of his, his story. And because when he enters this clan, you know, they really take him in and he, he begins to advise the, the sheikh on important matters and, and, you know, even helping the sheikh's son um, by giving him yogurt sometime, which cures him, you know. <laughs> I don't know exactly how this, this boy got better. Perhaps it was really good, <laughs> Syrian yogurt. But um, he became very trusted and, and a trusted servant to the sheikh. And his life completely changes. He becomes a shepherd along the Euphrates, and he dresses like the clan, and he, there's another, there's four other Armenians who are taken in by the same sheikh and has a romance with one of the, one of the Armenian women and even, you know, teasing and flirtation from, from some of the other um, women in the clan. And so it's just this, this beautiful moment where his life completely changes and it's really the kindness of strangers, which is why he survived the end of the war. They just fed him, clothed him. And, and loved him, and it gave him the strength to get strong again and you know, survive toward the end of the war. Jumping to the present, was it hard to find that the, the descendants of that tribe, and how did you do it? Well, I, you know, when I followed my grandfather's footsteps, I didn't think I could necessarily, I didn't think I would find them. It was really a pipe dream. I really wanted to see the land. And when I went into Syria, I went to Raqqa, um, and had the complete opposite experience there than we're seeing in the news today about hate. You know, it was all, it was all kindness and welcome. I had such a incredible experience there where I went to this very powerful Bedouin sheikh in the area and, and told him what I was what I was doing there. And of course, the people in the area, they all knew what happened to the Armenians. It's a very different situation than in Turkey because a lot of the massacres took place there and they were told this by their, their, their elders. And so he, of course, knew what happened. I, and I said how I wanted to find this clan, this descendants of this man who saved my family's life. And he was, he was moved by it. And, you know, next thing you know, he said, oh, where are you guys staying? Where are you staying? I was with the driver in transit. Where are you staying? And we hadn't had a, we didn't have a hotel in Raqqa, and we had just arrived. And he said, you must stay here with me. And so made his daughter move out of her room <laughs> and stayed there. And, you know, brought dates and just this whole, and that night we went out on the Euphrates. And it was a very different, you know, open air restaurant on the Euphrates with someone singing to us and serenading. And he invited Armenians from the town. And these Armenians were people who had settled in the area and were descendants of people who were deported into that area. And so this Bedouin sheikh started helping me. He called someone else. This person came over. They got on the phone. They started calling all the, the, the tribes and clans in the area. And I had certain details about, you know, I had this man's name, but who his, who his brother's name was, how old his son was during World War I. Between the, I knew which towns this person was. Um, I knew, I knew you know, the sheikh was um, located between two towns. And so with all that information and with this Bedouin sheikh, uh, we 
they ended up finding the clan and even though there were two guys with the same name yes two guys with the same name <laughs> but two only, shakes with the same name. but only one of them with a brother named ali and a son named ali who was a child of a certain age during the war and so they set it up and said do you want to go tomorrow and i was <laughs> pinch me yes absolutely and um, i went the next day and saw them it was an incredible experience and one of the most important moments in my life. Yes. I want to talk just briefly as we kind of bring this to the conclusion before a question. Writing a book like this. Tell us a little bit about what it meant when you came back and you had all the pieces of the puzzle around you and you have to assemble it now. Was that easy? Was that difficult? What was that process like? <laughs> Very difficult. <laughs> it was just, and, and also because I was obsessively researching it, thousands of documents and you I mean at one point and I had many many people important people who were in this room helping me guide me along the way I mean I had written chapters and chapters about one camp at one point with the the and so it was just streamlining it and trying to keep keep the story moving so I don't lose people with, with you know what would be an extremely academic book, which wasn't the book, which is, those books are very important, but it wasn't the book that I was trying to write. I was just trying to tell the story of my grandfather. And what, were you, anyone who's written would know what I'm about to talk about. It. Was there any anecdote or, or, or story that you just loved that wasn't doing its job in the greater whole and so you cut it out? And what, 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 what was that, if, if any? Like kind of yeah, anything on the cutting room floor that that was hard to part with. <laughs> there were so many moments that I just just condensed to a sentence because to keep the story moving, I'm trying. Oh, you know, I would say the stories that I I you know if that I wish I could have kept, but it was important that I didn't put it in the book because to keep the story moving. I think there were the stories of his life in the town before the war. They were just filled with hijinks, and I just love them. You know, just getting in a cart with his friends to go to a religious ceremony in another town, and they decide they should drink alcohol on the way. And his friend, one of his friends, was designated as the person to sneak the alcohol out of their house, away from their parents' eyes. And you know, they get in the car, but his his friend had drank it all or brought cough syrup instead. And so it's just these, these stories of these just, just of life, of just this lightness and, and just what their town was like. So, I mean, that could have been a, a book in itself, just his life before the war and, and, the, and, his, and his hijinks of at one point even summoning everyone, all his friends to an important meeting and they, they get there and he's very stern and he pretends it's about the building of the assembly hall. And then slowly, you know, someone arrives with a tray of coffee. And so they're looking around. And after that, a tray of ice cream arrives for everyone. And so he did that kind of thing for people. And, and, and those stories are really important to me because I, I got to see him as not just a survivor of a very sad, sad, episode in our history, but just as this person and his dreams and his personality, and it was very meaningful to me. I think it's a good place to end this. Uh, if there are questions, uh... All right, so just note about questions. Sally has a microphone. We want to make sure everyone can hear the question you're asking. So yeah, just raise your hand, and Sally will uh, come to you. <laughs> Is this okay? Yes. I actually have two questions. I'm going to have to ask two questions. I think so. <laughs> sure. Number one, what is the basis of the genocide? Was it um, fights over land? Was it fights over religion? Or was it just pure ethnic hatred? That's my first question. The second question is that to this day, the Turks deny that it ever happened. So what is their version of that? Okay, so the first question is a very complicated one. Um, so just to gloss over it. Um, on the eve of World War I, the Ottoman Empire was shrinking, and they were known as the sick man of Europe, ripe for dismemberment. And um, they 
had a disastrous loss in the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913. And many Muslim refugees from the Balkans poured into Anatolia. Um, Turkish nationalism just was fear and paranoia, and, and paranoia about losing more territory was rife. And at this at the, during this time, the Armenians who were long repressed, they were appealing, they were trying to get, they wanted reforms and appealing to you know, European powers. And it was just a volatile mix, and it's much more complicated than that, but that's probably an overview of just up until when the war began, and, um, and then in 1915, the genocide began. And, and the Turk? version of what happened? They would say that the Armenians were a dangerous group who were siding with the enemies of the Russians during the time of war, and that their killings were a sad, sad consequence of, of that. That it was, um, that Armenians were killing Turks, and Turks were killing Armenians, and you know, the equal amount of people died on both sides. I think that that's what that's someone would say, but you can always ask them. Hello, did, uh, did he find his family or the village, people from his village? Oh, my grandfather? Yes, um, at the, at, when, after the war ended, he made his way home and he actually, he disguised himself as a Turkish soldier in order to get onto this train and uh, it was carrying um, sick Turkish soldiers and so he just kept going east. Well, that was one point and another point, um, he was, delivering flour from that flour mill and then finally made his way home and, and saw his family again. And so it's an incredible moment for him and his family who didn't know if he was alive or not. Did they have to go through the desert and march and all that stuff? They were in a camp, but they were in a camp in what's now in central Anatolia. And it was really kind of haphazard what camp were more, more people, if one, some camps were worse than others. And where my grandfather's family was, it, it was still bad, where people died from disease. And, um, but it wasn't as bad as, as what he experienced. Um, uh, first, I want to say I'm very interested to read this book because I read a very favorable review of it in Barron's Financial Weekly. I, I read it because I'm the book review editor. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. And I, I, I commissioned, I, I want to emphasize that, I told my reviewer, who might take an interest in this, because he's, he's a descendant from uh, survivors of the Nazi genocide, that you've got to judge a book uh, on the, its merits of being a book, that it could have its heart in the right place, it could uh, have a noble theme, but uh, that, uh, that doesn't matter how good a book is it. He did call it a haunting journal of remembrance. He did write, its history is good fortune that a third generation descendant has reconstructed this vivid personal account at 100 years distance. I brought 10 copies of the review, so for those, for those who are interested. But uh, my, my, my question is this, I, I, uh, uh, first, uh, are you negotiating the movie rights? It sounds as though it does have, uh, you know, there are these parallel stories that work beautifully as movies. Um, I don't know who would play you, who would play you. But uh, it sounds like it could work very well uh, as, a, as a film. But uh, in addition, I want to bring up the same subject. Now, the word Holocaust denier is, an, is, a, is, a, is a term of opprobrium for those who deny that the Nazi Holocaust ever happened. Now, I was, as a teenager, uh, another related question, I read a very stirring novel that my father recommended, which had been a bestseller when he was a teenager, called The 40 Days of Musa Dog by the German Jewish writer Franz Werfel. Now, it's a very exciting military story, but it copiously documents the genocide against the Armenians. And uh, so when I grew up, I was surprised that uh, this was apparently uh, at issue historically. Uh, I think you do have passages in your book in which you do express some anger at the denial uh, of, the, of, of the idea that, uh, that, that, that there was a genocide against the Armenians. Just want to ask you about that. Yes, I, I was very angry before I went on my trip. And once I went to Syria, it, it demystified the whole, and, and started speaking with Turkish people and, and, and 
and very slowly at first bringing up my background because it was very, maybe that's been a hundred years in my family, you hear the story grow up in it, and, I was just, and my mother was fearful about me going. And, and I, I went there and I had a very different experience because even those who denied it, I, you know, you, you, you grow up and you hear, oh, so how can someone deny what happened to my family? And I just think they must be evil people. And, and for me, it, it wasn't that. When I went there, it's about education. For me, it's about education. And when you have a government that is saying this did not happen, and they're teaching children in school that it didn't happen, they're teaching this history, of course they're going to grow up believing that. And so for me, in the end, it's about education. And um, I, but I feel very happy that we're in this new digital age where people can educate themselves. They don't have to just listen to a set narrative on what happened. They can read, you know, the, the Germany was an ally of the Ottomans during the war, and they can read their consular reports of what they were witnessing, what happened to the Armenians. So. So my anger dissipated. I didn't really feel that anger anymore. When your grandfather uh, decided to leave Istanbul, why did he ever explain uh, either his journals or to his children? Why the United States? Why New York as opposed to any, anywhere else where he could have gone? His sister was. His sisters were here first. And some of their family members are here in the audience. And they um, helped my grandfather and my mother all come to this country and then loaned him money in order to open his candy store once he was here. So, yeah, they really led the way. Um, I want to ask you so, I know in many families, Armenian families, there's a legacy of silence around the topic. And I guess I'm curious, when you were doing your research, if you encountered that. And, and then also, um, I have so many questions, but also, um, in your family, when you were unearthing all of this information, was that, did you feel licensed? You know, were there moments where you felt like you were maybe crossing into territory that was uncomfortable for your mom, or so on and so forth? And if so, how you? That. Yes, um, it was it was very hard to tell the story. And basically, when you're you're telling family history, it's, you're basically going into business with your family. And so, it it was it could be everyone. It's such a heavy weight on a family, and everyone relates to it in a different way. And I'm just so grateful that my family supported me to tell this story. My grandfather had three children. And, um, and, and it's just, I feel so fortunate that they trusted me to tell the story because it's a huge weight to tell someone's story like this correctly. And so that's why I gave it my heart in the last 10 years of my life. And um, yes, and of course about the legacy of silence, I definitely found that because there were accounts that I wanted to know. and. My grandfather's cousin, um, so my mother's cousin, her, her, her grandmother was in the same camp as my grandfather, and so of course, I'm, I just can this my family. Okay, what accounts do we have, and what can I do? How can I expand my grandfather's account through primary sources? And my um, mother's cousin said, you know, my mother would, my, she, she would not talk about it. She would not talk about it at all, and the one time that we said, a tape recorder in front of her, she stopped. And so you, there was definitely a legacy of silence and it depended on the family. I also, in my research, UCLA has some really great oral histories where they went in the 70s, I believe, in different periods, and they, res they, they knew that the survivors were dying, and so they interviewed them. And that was a, a tremendous resource for me. That was one of the first places I went to just look at all the accounts of people from my grandfather's town. What did they recall? What were the events that they found important? And also the people who survived the East, East what's now Eastern Syria, which is Derizor, what did they say? And so I went through those accounts as well. And then you start to see people kind of mentioning the same thing or cross-referencing the same event. And so I knew that would be the direction I should head in. Okay, 
over here. Um, when you went to the town of the clan, um, and they came to embrace you, like, what words did you say? How did how did that interaction play out? And after my second question, I also have many questions. Uh, but my second question is, um, how do you move on after a project like this? <laughs> Maybe people will have suggestions. <laughs> um, they they completely embraced me, and I was pretty speechless because. When I arrived, I thought maybe three people would be there. And when I got out of the car, it took me a moment to realize they were all there for me. And and then it was just it was just very natural. It was just one of those moments that unfolded very slowly. And you knew how important it was as you were living it. And you know, we were all and then after that I was just ushered into this room with them and we all started talking and I had a translator there, but what I really had to say to them, it was just the reason I wanted to find them, which is that I wanted to thank them for saving my grandfather's life and just wanted to pay my respects to them. And I returned in 2009 to talk with them more and interview with them more, and, and that was, you know, before the war. Oh, you know what? I, I met both. My driver was Kurdish, and um, a lot of the people I met were Turkish. So that in, in Turkey, and in, in Syria, it was both. You know, also there is a lot of Turkish people. Right. Met Turkish people or Turkish people? Right. Absolutely. You know, the I I, I stuck pretty closely to where my grandfather traveled, so I didn't go into what were the east, you know, the eastern provinces and where most of the Armenians lived. I, I basically went to his town and then I followed the deportation route. So I didn't encounter as many Kurdish people that if, than if I had gone to those regions more north of that. But, but yeah. Is that the last question? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much.